I think the first thing the court has to Trump's address attorney. is whether or not a First Amendment constitutional as applied challenge is right for pretrial consideration. Being candid with the court, if the court says it's not right, then making the rest of the argument is probably not the right time. On the other hand, we have already argued under Hall, and there's been other cases cited, that as long as we agree to, for purposes of the motion, the facts, not other allegations, but the facts, it is right. So I almost pause it back to the court whether sure. or not we're in that posture. And we can do a little quick ping pong here if we need to, just so we know kind of what the guardrails are. So I take a closer look at Hall, and I think there's a follow-up case, I think it was Boyer, maybe Bayer, I forget what it was called. And certainly they're going right at it as an as-applied challenge. There's a little language there I wanted you all to kind of give me your take on, where I think the quote was, it's well established that vagueness challenges to statutes which do not involve the First Amendment freedoms must be examined in the light of the facts at hand. And so if you take the inverse of that, it almost makes it sound like you should not be considering First Amendment challenges as applied. So I'm curious your take on that. But setting that aside, I mean, it certainly seems in other jurisdictions, as applied First Amendment challenges happen all the time. And so it could just be that we haven't actually had the opportunity here in Georgia to address that on the Another first. Know. But what also seemed clear, even reading Hall, is that if we're in making an as applied challenge, we're within the confines of the indictment because unlike Hall, the state hasn't said, here are some additional facts that we're willing to stipulate to or concede to or anything like that. Any and all of that, any reactions? I understand how the court could look at the inverse, but I think as written with all the justices agreeing, that it is a First Amendment challenge would be ripe, a constitutional challenge on the First Amendment grounds, as long as we accept all the well-pleaded factual allegations in the indictment and don't go beyond those. Now, as the court has indicated, the state at this point has not set forth or stipulated to any other facts, although I think some of them, for example, the fact of how a letter gets to the Secretary of State or telephone call that is an issue, I think those things are clear throughout the record in this case, but I'm not sure that they're necessary for the court to make an as-applied challenge. And as such, I think we can be limited to the well-pleaded facts, both in the RICO count, count one, as well as the other counts in the indictment. Well, let's just start there. Mr. Wakeford, any reactions kind of to some of those things I brought up in Mr. Sadow's response? Your Honor, and I'm glad you pointed to that language because that was going to be the first thing I wanted to address today. This Hall guy looks new. descends from a case called National Dairy, which the language in Hall says, in cases like this, we're confined, we look at the charge conduct. That's what we look to. And Hall, of course, was, they looked outside of the charging instrument to these other facts. Yeah. So it seems like that's not going to be an issue here because the state's not saying here's our entire theory of the case. So what stops us from doing an as-applied First Amendment challenge just based on the indictment itself? And that's a limited one, and you kind of have a leg up since you get to put whatever you want in the indictment generally. And that's kind of the thing, is that when you look at the post-hearing brief from the defendant, and you yes. actually look at footnote two, he's not actually asking the court to look at, at the well-pleading allegations in the indictment. He's actually asking the court to read out certain words, all of which have to do with intent. So footnote two on page two, he says, if, if, if it says something's unlawfully or knowingly or willfully done, that's not a factual allegation the court should consider. So the suggestion seems to be, oh, let's look to Hall. Hall says we can play kind of fast and loose with what the facts are. And in this case, what we want the court to do is read out certain language from the indictment, actually not consider it. Okay, just let's certain. say we don't get to that further because step. Because Trump and, has First Amendment just, rights to speak. Just getting over that threshold, so even if there was no footnote the indictment. Two, Any position at this point on, can we make an as-applied First Amendment analysis of this? So it's true in federal courts, it's kind of all over the place. Some courts explicitly stay away from it, and other courts go into it. We know that in this defendant's case in D.C., actually, Judge Chutkin explicitly went forward and made uh, an analysis based Chutkin. on the allegations in the indictment there. But not every J6 court does. Case. And some federal courts stay away from it for a very specific reason, which is that there are still factual allegations which have to be settled by a fact finder for a jury. And the and, reason... And looking at all the cases that you found, ones that didn't do it, and generally they're going to say, we don't have the record, we don't have the facts. But there, were there any that explicitly said, even though I could just look solely at the indictment, I'm still not going to do an as-applied challenge? Well, I think that's how we get to a case here in Georgia, and it's a case your honor cited back in October when you explicitly ruled, we're not yeah. going to get into this. That, that was the 11th the, Circuit case, though, wasn't it? You're talking about... I'm talking about the major case, okay. which is a Georgia case. The major case is where they say, okay, this is a pretrial, as applied, First Amendment challenge, but essentially what this boils down to is an argument about intent. That's what the defendant's really talking about. And when you look at what the defendant wants to argue about here today, it's just saying, well, I was talking, I was just a guy saying things. I was just advocating. I was just speaking my mind. Yes, free speech. And so all Trump. of this is protected and therefore just like the everyone else has to go away and, that is and a i question. think that's your strongest argument on if we're in the analysis of the as applied challenge i'm still just trying to get over and really understand the procedural element of it well and that's what major says is that because okay. that intent question has yet to be answered and the jury is the person who is the entity that answers that question it's premature to consider this you can't say that the first amendment has been applied or that the as applied challenge can succeed at this stage because there's still questions that have to be answered yeah i think it was like an overbreath on terroristic threat
rights, right? It begins with over breadth, but then it moves into an as applied challenge. That's the last part of the major. Did they actually say premature or did they just say denied? They say that they cannot say that the it's unconstitutional under the First Amendment as applied to the defendant in that scenario because there are still intent questions. So jury- does that actually maybe suggest then that they did do an as applied challenge? It's just very hard for a defendant to win that because all you have is the indictment. That is a way that you could interpret it. It would suggest that an as applied challenge cannot succeed under the First Amendment because speech integral to criminal conduct is not protected. A well-pleaded indictment is going to demonstrate that speech that is fled as part of a criminal charge is integral to criminal conduct. And so there's nothing to decide if you're looking and you're cabined by the indictment. So we sort of have two routes here. Neither of them result in the grant of this motion. One says, the court says this is premature. There's questions that have to be answered. Any First Amendment challenge has to happen after there's a factual record to look to. And the other says, okay, I can get to this today. It's not that I can't. I can, but there's nowhere to go because all of the speech is pled as integral to criminal conduct and therefore it's not protected by the first. I don't remember if Alvarez was a post-trial or pre-trial thing, but you could envision an indictment where perhaps they've drafted it to solely target speech because of its falsity or something like that. So maybe there's a use for an as-applied challenge in that kind of a situation. That's a fair point, Your Honor. It's just not the situation here. And it's not going to be the situation in almost any case. That was a special case where, of course, you have a very unique statute that was punishing. But that was really a facial challenge, too, because it was saying, like, this is just punishing falsity for falsity's own sake. None of the charges in this case are about that. They are about falsity employed or statements employed as part of a a pattern of criminal conduct in numerous ways. So there's nowhere to go. And so I think it requires dismissal or denial at this stage because you either can't reach it because there's more facts that have to be established or the indictment establishes that none of the speech is protected by the First Amendment. And the inquiry immediately ends. All right. So back to you, Mr. Sadow. Let's move forward with the idea that we're making an as applied challenge solely confined to the indictment. This isn't a facial challenge. You're not saying any of these statutes are on this face. Correct. Unconstitutional. And your argument is that this is core political speech. So some crimes can be achieved solely through speech, though. Terroristic threats, you know, solicitation. Why is that not what's happening here as alleged? I think it requires kind of a detailed analysis, so if I may. Sure. So the first thing we have to decide is whether or not, and we're talking about President Trump. We're not talking about the actions of others. We have to look and see whether or not that which has been alleged as facts is in fact core political speech, political discourse, protected speech at its zenith. I don't think there's any question that statements, comments, speech, expressive conduct that deals with campaigning or elections has always been found to be at the zenith of protected speech. What do we have here? We have election speech. So it's highly protected. One must determine immediately whether that constitutes core political speech, and I suggest that it does. Now, does that make a difference? Ultimately, yes, because the more core speech, the more it is protected, the less the government should be involved in restricting it. Or criminalizing it. I don't it. think there's any real doubt about that. So then the question becomes, is the mere fact that the state here represents that it is false or fraudulent under the statute, is that enough? Now, what I just heard, I think the state's position would be yes. All we have to do is say it's false, it's integral to criminal conduct, it's fraud, and therefore it can't be unconstitutional as applied. I don't believe that that's what the law says. I think what the law really looks at is as to each individual application of a statute, whether or not the falsity in and of itself alone is sufficient. And I think the case law indicates that that's not so, particularly, and I don't need to go back through in detail everything that Alvarez said, but I think Alvarez is important because even when you talk in terms of, and I'll start with we're looking at the majority, what I would actually, I guess it would be the plurality opinion that by Judge Kennedy, but for purposes of interest to us, the Chief Justice and Justice Sotomayor agree. So now we're talking about two people still on the court. And I'm looking specifically at page 723, in which the court goes on to say, were the court to hold that the interest in truthful discourse alone is sufficient to sustain a ban on speech, absent any evidence that the speech would be used to gain a material advantage, it would give government a broad sensorial power unprecedented in this court's cases or in our constitutional tradition. So that's the beginning part of plurality saying the way to attack false speech or false political speech or core speech is with truth, which is precisely what was going on. We're talking about this time period without getting outside the indictment. You're talking about at the same time the allegations are being made, factual allegations in the indictment, you have others that are fighting that off. The government's position would be with truth, the state's position with truth. Moving beyond Alvarez, that part of it. So there's, it's only speech that has been criminalized. You have Justice Kagan with Justice Breyer. And we want and here, I think, that. gets to the crux of where we are. And this is the concurring 
concurring opinion. It goes through a litany of false statement cases in which the government's position in Alvarez is being false in and of itself is enough. That is, once you determine it's false, we're done. Is it free speech but or is it a crime? That's not what the concurrent says, and that's not what the dissent says. The concurrent says, basically, that these judicial statements cannot be read to mean no protection at all. False factual statements can serve useful human objectives, for example, in social contexts where they may prevent embarrassment, da, 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 in public contexts where they may stop or panic in the face of danger, and even in technical, philosophical, and scientific contexts where, as Socrates' method suggests, Examination of a false statement, even if made deliberately to mislead, can promote a form of thought that ultimately helps realize the truth. And then it goes on and says, even a false statement may be deemed to make a valuable contribution to public debate since it brings about the clear perception and the livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. Absolutely. So this is you can the proposition it that it's not the falsity alone that controls. It's the context in which the speech is made. And if it is deemed false, and for purposes of the indictment, we have to assume that it is false because that's what the facts have been alleged. That doesn't mean it's the end of the analysis. Why do we not also have to assume, since it's an allegation, I think you say in your brief, that it's unlawful, willful, and knowingly false? Because at least our position, President Trump's position is, those are words are not words of fact. Those are words of legal connotation. And that while they have meaning, that would allow, for example, let's go to Alvarez and the Stolen Valor Act. Just because they alleged that it was unlawful didn't mean it wins. That is, it doesn't mean that the government wins. But that's because they decided that wasn't a crime at all. I mean, that was a facial challenge where they said this statute, even if you violated it, violates the First Amendment. You've said that the RICO statute, you can violate it. You know, it's so we make, we put legal conclusions and in indictments all the time. I think that's going to be part of Mr. Schaefer's argument in just a minute. I mean, you said a moment ago, just because the state pleads it, you don't think that's enough in an as-applied challenge. And I'm trying to figure out. As to <clears throat> statements such as legal conclusions are unlawful and so forth. Now, if there had been, I guess if the allegations had been brought Broader, maybe we wouldn't be at that crossroads, but those aren't facts. The facts, as I've outlined or we've outlined in our brief, you take the overt acts, you look at those overt acts, and then those at the same time, and then look at the substantive offenses or conspiracy offenses in the rest of the body of the indictment. Words like unlawful don't change that. At least that's our position. So now we're talking in terms, going back to Alvarez and the concurring opinion, you're talking in terms, falsity alone is not enough. There's stuff, there are situations, contexts, which override just the falsity alone. And again, the political discourse, the political speech, the more significant it is to certain issues, clearly being president of the United States at the time, dealing with elections and campaigning, calling into question what had occurred, at least in the election of 2020 for president. That's the height of political speech. And then you go even to the dissent, which I think is yes. as important because now you have Alito and Thomas, again, members of the current court. And I go to that, even where there is a wide scholarly consensus concerning a particular matter, the truth is served by allowing that consensus to be challenged without fear of reprisal. Today's accepted wisdom sometimes turns out to be mistaken. And in these contexts, even a false statement may be deemed to make a valuable yes. contribution to public debate since it brings about the clear perception and livelier impression of truth yes. produced by its collision with error. Exactly. Uh, citing That's why the misinformation US people Supreme are Court. idiots. We That's want the all essence the of what we have there. right here. That's the facts that have been alleged. A Essentially, the state's position is because, as alleged, what President Trump said speech-wise or expressed either through his speech or conduct, which is still freedom of expression, because that's false in the eyes of the state, it's lost all protections of the First Amendment. And the concurring opinion and the dissenting opinion in Alvarez suggests just the opposite. If anything, under the circumstances, it needs more protection, not less protection. So keeping that in mind, let's move instead to the conspiracy counts, which are counts 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Basically, what the state's position is on that, because it took this position previously in its filing on September 27, 2023, in response to that which was filed by Chesbro. And I'm aware, of course, of the court's order that dealt with Chesbro, and it didn't deal with the as applied. So I'm dealing... And more so in that one, as I go back and look at it, there was a much more kind of concerted effort to bring in facts outside of the indictment, right? And they started talking about, well, there was a transcript at the meeting. There was 
challenge this, you know, so it didn't really seem to be a true as applied challenge. Right. But as the court noted in its order, <laughs> at that point, it didn't determine that it was ripe for a pretrial challenge. So I'm taking what Chesbro, what the state said as it applies now, because it says in that brief that it was both as to facial and as applied challenges. Essentially, what it says is as those counts, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, as to 9, 11, and 17, the mere fact that it alleges a fraud is enough. That is, that's what's on page five and page six. Since each of those statutes prohibit conduct involving fraud, we don't go any further. And I'm suggesting that's wrong, that you must go further. You must look at the speech itself, the expressive conduct itself in connection with those specific statutes. That's what the as applied is. The fact that it's a fraudulent statute. Now you want to look and see why under the circumstances here, the language speech of the president falls within that. And if you look at it in that sense, the mere fact that it's false is all that they have. They don't, there's not a finding that the speech itself, beyond the speech itself, is fraudulent. What the state wants to do is say, we have a goal. We have an objective here that we put forward. Steal the election in an unlawful fashion. I say change that for a second to legitimate concern about the validity of the election. If that was the way you focused on it, which is a way to do it as applied, even with the facts. Then it's not criminal. Would what President Trump said on those counts be a protected speech? And the answer is it has to be. Yes. Because the only thing that makes it fraudulent is the state saying it's false. Right. Take every one of those and say, okay, it's not false. It's protected. The only reason it becomes unprotected in the state's opinion is because they call it false. And that's what Alvarez doesn't allow. In and of itself, it cannot be simply the content based. It has to be contextual. And the contextual here is a political core value being addressed, elections and campaigning. And that holds true for the all of those that deal with the conspiracy. And then you deal with counts 29 and 39, which is the false statements charges. This is good stuff. It's like now it is clear that the Supreme Court would find that a statement made under 1001, 18 U.S.C. 1001, would constitute the appropriate, let's say, abridgment or non-protected conduct or speech. But Georgia statute's a little different here because we don't have a materiality. It's the mere fact of falsity, which violates, according to Georgia, Georgia law counts 29 and 39. You don't have to do anything else but make a false statement, even if it is political discourse, even if it is in the heightened context that I've suggested. If it's false, it's a violation of the law. And I'm saying as applied to political speech, that can't be constitutional as applied. Remember, no materiality, simply the fact that he said it. So essentially what the state's position on that would be, it didn't have to be sent to anyone of consequence in the state agency. It just had to be said. Indeed, if you look at the most and probably best example is count 39. That's a letter written after the election in September of 2021 from President Trump to Secretary of State in which it has, according to that, one statement. And that constitutes, according to the state, falsity. But it's clearly political speech. And it's clearly being related to the activities and the matters that of election and campaign, even after the fact, it's still related just to that. So looking at 29 and 39, I think you have a situation in which the falsity alone is all they have as applied here to political speech. It is unconstitutional as applied under the First Amendment. And then finally, you have count 27. Quick question which, on that. Had you found a anyone ever attempted a facial challenge on 161020? Yeah, in fact, I don't remember the name of the case, but it has been upheld, even though there was references to the fact that maybe materiality should be part of it. That's got to be the, yeah, Haley. Haley. the Haley case. That's yeah. right. That's, That's right. So, okay. yes, facially, yes. But Haley, of course, didn't go to the extent of trying to determine sure. as applied applied in a particular context. And it's, again, I don't wish to repeat what I just said, but here we're talking about the heightened value of core political speech. And then with 27, we're talking about the filing of a false document. Again, the only thing there that involves President Trump is an attestation on the complaint. Now, all it refers to in the indictment is complaint. But again, we're talking about the falsity or the filing of false document is the falsity in the document itself. And I'm suggesting under the circumstances that and that alone wouldn't violate that statute statute as applied. So regardless of the facial challenges, the question becomes here, is the mere fact that the state says fraud or false statement enough to get by an as applied challenge? And our suggestion is it is not. Now let's go to Rico. Good stuff from Steve. And I think Rico is more difficult, to be honest with you, because we're talking about a much broader statute. At the same time, when you look at the allegations against President Trump, all of the allegations involve expressive conduct or speech. We have false statements 
political edge in overt acts, and again, all of which are political core value, political discourse. You have false statements in overt acts 1, 5, 7, 8, 17, 93, 97, 108, 113, 133, 135, and 157. The only allegations there are falsity. There is no allegation beyond the fact that those statements are made. And I'm suggesting that, again, heightened political speech has to be looked at differently. When it comes to tweets, which is at least the way the state sets it forth, is also political speech. And here, certainly by then president of the United States, you have tweets in 22, 26, 27, 32, 75, 100, 101, 106, 114, 128, 138, and 139. So the majority of the overt acts involve false statements or tweets, which are clearly political speech. How best to deal with that under the circumstances? To prosecute those under a broad RICO charge, supposedly with uh, contesting election by, I guess, illegitimate speech or expressive conduct? Or is the way that we are set up as a country is that the First Amendment plays through this by others, by those that are complaining that it's false, proving it's false, bringing forth the truth. That's the essence of what Alvarez has said. That's the essence of what case called Brown versus Hartledge, which is cited in Alvarez. It's 456 U.S. 45 at 61, a 1982 decision. All of those speak in terms of when you're dealing with that speech, that political speech, you're best to deal with it through the pushing forth a counter view of truth, not prosecuting yes. the speech maker or the person that is articulating his political view. Debated Here we've, court of we've public done opinion, just the opposite. Not court of law. We have decided that because of those views were unpopular and in state's opinion false, we must prosecute them to stop them from happening again. And because they hate Trump, which is he's a political again, enemy. the essence of why it's unconstitutional as applied, because that's not what the law says. Finally, the rest of the overt acts, the telephone calls or meetings or requests, no false state. They're just acts, expressive acts. And they're in there as well. Those are political acts. And for the court's benefit, because I know there's a lot of overt acts, those are 9, 14, 19, 28, 30, 31, 40, 42, 43, 44, 90, 95, 112. Remember, in the old indictment is Rico 123. is a conspiracy plus all or, the overt acts. Number two is now, I think, it's 125. The conspiracy. That's what he's giving us. 130, 131, 140, These are not overt acts. These are speech. These are moments of talking. There is nothing alleged factually protected. against President Trump that is not political speech. It's all speech. So what this court has to decide is... Called people, is met the people, state's asked position them to that fraud or false statements under these circumstances, which I suggest really is alone, is that enough to get it by an as-applied challenge? Our position is it's not. Is there another way to look at this? They're going to argue at the same time that it's integral to criminal conduct. But it's the speech that's being punished. That is the criminal conduct. Yeah, RICO is not, not a crime, not according to the criminal to conduct, there would never be an indictment for, for the RICO against President Dismiss Trump this, or Honor. any of these other counts. Take out the political speech, no criminal charges. Political speech disagreed with, basis for all charges. I think that is the best way for me to sum up where our position is. All right. Good Thank stuff you, Mr. from Sado. Steve Sado. All right, Mr. Wakeford or Mr. Floyd, if, if there are any points that you wanted to address or respond to. Uh, maybe I'll start you off with this. It certainly seems that the primary case driving Mr. Sado's argument would be Alvarez. And, you know, because that's a fractured kind of plurality opinion, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on just how much that can drive this. And back in December, it was also citing Alvarez as the primary case. I wonder if that's even the best one for your argument. New prosecutor, I, I think, Donald Wakeford, who is probably not sleeping um, with Fanny. To address the first, I think, elephant in this courtroom. I'm not sleeping that with they, Fanny. Uh, Judge Chotkin in D.C. has evaluated all of these arguments. Who uh, cares? She's biased. Already. So I would refer your honor to that court's analysis yeah, because yeah, I'm yeah, hardly going to improve upon the findings of the federal Maybe judge. Maybe you should reference However, anger on too. Speaking with specifically to Alvarez, the, the, it is a plurality opinion with several different opinions written by other justices. What they all agree on, though, is that Alvarez doesn't change the law that speech integral to criminal conduct is not protected under the first Amendment, and that that's not what Alvarez was about. It was about punishing falsity for its own sake. So the question is, is that what the state is doing here? And by fundamentally rewriting the indictment, the defendant is suggesting today that that is somehow what the state is doing, when actually what Your the state is saying is, is that that's the these problem. statements made by the defendant were all employed as part of criminal activity, various conspiracies, frauds, intentions with deceit, and violations of the law. It's not just that they were false. It's not that the defendant has been hauled into a courtroom because the prosecution doesn't like what he said. He is free to make statements and to file lawsuits and to make other legitimate protests. What he is not allowed to do is employ his speech and his expression and his 
statements as part of a criminal conspiracy to violate Georgia's RICO statute, to impersonate public officers. What other acts are you alleging? False documents, it's not speech. And to make false statements to the government. That's what he's alleged to do. He's not charged under 161020 because he told some lies. Although it is very interesting to hear counsel for Mr. Trump tell us about the usefulness of lies. He's not being prosecuted for lying. He's being prosecuted for lying to the government, an act which is illegal because it does harm to the government. That's the reason that it's illegal. That's why it's different from the statute evaluated in Alvarez. Same thing with filing a false document. It's not just that you've made a false statement. It's that you swore to it in a court document and submitted it to the court. That does harm to the judicial system. That's obviously different from just falsity being punished for its own sake. And that is what each and every charge in the indictment demonstrates, is that these statements are part of criminal conduct that is larger than just the false statement on its own, especially with the RICO charge, where what we see is that this is a criminal organization whose members and associates engaged in various criminal activities, including but not limited to false statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, forgery, filing false documents, influencing witnesses, computer theft, computer trespass, and on and on and on. What the defendant is suggesting to your honor is trying to get around to the fact that it's almost saying that because these statements are false, that these charges should be dismissed. It's like, well, we can't punish falsity on its own. And yet each time you look at the charge, the government's saying, the state is saying that he lied. So that must be the end of the inquiry. But that's not the end of the inquiry at all. That's not what the indictment says. It's not just that he lied over and over and over again, as counsel for the defendant points out by listing all of the instances in the indictment. It's that each of those was employed as part of criminal activity with criminal intentions. And we finally get to a place where they're it's, just it, jumping it's, to that. They're uh, where I knew we would intent. end up, which is saying, I believe your honor was requested to he think about it as investigating as an election, but as legitimate concern about election issues. Yeah, like Trump did. Well, that sounds like a trial argument to me. But this is why I began by talking about intent with your honor, because I knew we were going to end up in this exact place where he said, sure, you can look at them as lies because they weren't true. Or you could think this is just well-intentioned concerns from an American citizen speaking his mind. And that, of course, would probably be a pretty good argument to put before a jury. And I expect we will see it. But it's not a basis for dismissing the indictment. The whole question of intent is the indictment no doubt should have going never to be brought, been brought up. Brought it can only be against protected speech. That's the point. But what we have heard here today is an attempt to rewrite the indictment. No, you to take out the parts that incorrectly are incorrectly wrote it in the first say, place. Well, That's it's all, all speech. Out. It's all talking. And he was just a guy asking questions and not someone who was part of an overarching criminal conspiracy trying to overturn election results for an election he did not win by violating the RICO statute, it by making rigged. false statements to the government, filing false documents, by impersonating officers and doing a whole host of other activity, which is harmful in addition to the falsity of the statements employed to make them happen. So I think there's been a suggestion that your honor can sort of reframe what you're looking at, but Alvarez does nothing to shift the basis that the court should stand upon when evaluating the indictment. And that is to say, is this speech being punished solely because it's false, solely because of its viewpoint? Yes. Or is it speech that's being demonstrated as integral to a pattern of criminal activity? No. First one. And finally, the, the fact that it speaks to political concerns or core political speech, and this is something that the court in D.C. thoroughly addressed, does not change the fact that it can be employed as part of criminal conduct. The mere fact that you're talking about issues of public concern or core political speech, which may be completely fine and protected in certain, in most contexts, does not mean that you cannot be indicted if you use that kind of speech to pursue illegal activities. That's the whole nature of the question. So it's very circular, and I would direct your honor to page six to seven seven of the post-hearing brief filed by defendant Trump, which says the speech integral to criminal conduct exception of the First Amendment does not apply here because all the charge conduct constitutes First Amendment protected speech. That is a very neat circle. The First Amendment protects us because all the speech is protected by the First Amendment. And in the end, no matter how much we hear about the, obviously the noble protections afforded by the First Amendment, all of this is an effort to get your honor not to look at the basic fact that this speech, this expression, all this activity is important employed as part of a pattern of criminal conduct in a host of ways. It was exposed in because your honor is bound by the indictment. The government look at the indictment for and can't look beyond a rigged it. election. If, if we're going to get into this at this stage, the in Fulton then County. there's nowhere to go, as I said at the beginning, because this is all alleged as part of a pattern of criminal conduct and not protected by the First Amendment. So you go through Any somebody's other, tweet history and just gobble up all like the messages and say, oh, there's a conspiracy here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wakeford. Thank you, your honor. You just pick out. May I add one point briefly? Sure. I'm just going to be on one specific point, not duplicate the Fanny's argument made before. Don't think sleeping with this guy either. I don't, um, I'm not sure, though. John I believe Floyd. defendant Trump fundamentally misunderstands the role of an overt act in a conspiracy case. As we've discussed many times,
times previously, this is a RICO conspiracy case. And so we heard Mr. Sadow discuss various overt acts and say, well, but this is just a tweet. This is just a phone call. This is just X. The unspoken underlying and incorrect premise then is that every overt act must be a crime. As we've discussed a number of times, and as the state has set forth extensively in multiple briefs, that's not true. The purpose of an overt act is to show the conspiracy is an operation. It is not a separate crime. It doesn't have to satisfy the elements. It doesn't have to be pled with that level of detail. Fine, but why can you criminalize order, think, something that's, that's not criminal, which old. is free speech? And so to say we can't mention this particular act or this particular conduct because it's not a crime or it's protected by the First Amendment, the answer to that is actually so what? Because it you could be charge whatever you it could want. be legal conduct. It could be First Amendment protected conduct. That also shows there's a conspiracy in operation. And that's as long as it serves that purpose, it's fine. It's and an so election, over an election speech. should not be examined by a standard that has no application to them. They are not separate freestanding offenses. And there is federal case law that maybe we can cite it to you that has said an overt act can involve First Amendment activity. Its purpose is not to be something that is separately charged here, separately Let's subject to a separate involve, sentence. But not be the main its purpose is to the show that there act. is a conspiracy and it's an operation. Georgia requires, Georgia Rico requires one overt act by any one defendant. So of course the RICO would stand if anything, any of the 161 overt acts alleged constituted an overt act. It would only take one. It doesn't take any by Mr. Trump. So they can just go find whatever they um, want and pull it out. But the point is, overt act, overt act, we have an abundance overt act, overt of them act. by Mr. Trump. And All of for comments. purposes of the RICO statute and the manner in which it functions, it doesn't matter whether that's First Amendment conduct or not. I mean, we've my colleague has fully explained why much of this conduct is not shielded under any circumstance by the First Amendment. And I don't mean to contradict that in any respect. But it's important not to lose sight of the function the Overt Act plays, the role it plays in a conspiracy case here, because it is not the role being suggested by Defendant Trump. All right. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. All right, Mr. Sidon, I'll give you a couple minutes. Final word. Thank you, sir. If I heard what Mr. Floyd just said, Trump's attorney, Steve Sado, that if everything President Trump said was assumed true and included in the RICO indictment, and therefore now we're talking about true political speech, not alleged false, he could still be prosecuted for the violation of RICO. Could the overt acts as alleged, let's say even the overt acts ran afoul of the First Amendment, You're saying that wouldn't be fatal to count one. Because at that point, if there the could be some other thing they prove that's not alleged as an overt act, that may as, be, as I understand it, I understood it as well. But what I'm suggesting is if all of the overt acts are nothing more than core political speech or expressive conduct and nothing else is alleged, which is not protected by the First Amendment, then you have an insufficient basis for which he has been indicted because he's being indicted for First Amendment conduct. Conduct speech and not for unprotected speech. And therefore, the statement that was made about if it were true, we could still use it as an overt act suggests that they can prosecute <laughs> true speech, which is what we're trying to get to right. here. It's they, the nature of the can. speech, the political speech, he just the said heightened value of such, which gets this situation different than others. And the fact that it comes from then president of the United States. Going back to what was said in addition by the state, what the state claims is criminal here is lying to the government. That's what it said. That's the exact reason why in several of the Supreme Court cases, it's been found to be protected speech because it deals with the government and falsity and sense of communication with or to the government is best dealt with through true speech, right. not through prosecutions in, because prosecutions chill speech. And when it comes to political core speech, what you don't want is chilled. Trump's uh, speech I use, was the true speech. Uh, That's the problem. I have a, a co Trump was right. They were wrong. Able to pull things up and help me inform the court until the computer shuts down. And looking at what Haley says, just to give you an idea of how the Georgia court, the Supreme Court might look at this. There's a quote from Haley and it says, while there is no constitutional value in false statements of fact, such erroneous statements are nevertheless inevitable in free debate and punishment of error runs the risk of inducing a cautious and restrictive exercise of the constitutionally guaranteed freedoms of speech and press. Accordingly, the First Amendment requires that we protect some falsehood in order to protect speech that matters. And I think that's what we're talking about here. To end this, and again, we're focusing on President Trump's conduct at, at the time that he, in fact, is the head of the executive branch. As the president, executing the laws in there a is rigged election. There is references to this in Brown v. Hartledge, and I cited that earlier. A well-publicized yet bogus complaint on election eve raises the concerns that you may have some impact that would affect an election 
action. But the preferred First Amendment remedy of more speech, not enforced silence, has special force. Underlying our dependence upon more speech is the presupposition the right conclusions are more likely to be gathered out of a multitude of tongues than through any kind of authoritative selection. To many, this is and always will be folly, but we have staked upon it all. And for speech concerning public affairs is more than self-expression. It is the essence of self-government. And that comes from Garrison v. Louisiana, which is cited also in Alvarez. Bottom line here is this. But for protected First Amendment speech, President Trump would not be charged in RICO or the other counts. Yep. Take out the protected speech no and case. you don't have an underlying basis for which to charge him. And since that violates the Constitution as applied to the charges here and his speech here and his position here, this is ripe for a constitutional challenge. One step further. If it's not ripe now and we get into intent, when does the court determine that? Do you determine that after we have a trial? The, I think it would be the directed verdict stage. Well, right. But would it? In That's all, a sufficiency all, of evidence. With all inferences, yeah, in favor That's of the That's the whole question. I mean, do we go through the whole trial? God forbid there should be a conviction. And then we go back to try and determine as applied. I'm suggesting the reason it's ripe now and the reason why we don't even get to a trial is because it. it's unconstitutional to force and accuse, be it the president of the United States, former president, or anyone else to stand trial on protected speech. And I think that's what Alvarez and the progeny previous to that and after. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sado. Good stuff. Mr. Gillen, do you need a minute before we dive in or can we get started? There's Sorry. some other things that I wanted to talk about and have the court focus on as it relates to some of the other aspects of demur. Why they not valid? to focus on that in this way. Number one, I want to talk a little bit about some of the counts impersonating public officers. I want to talk about the forgery, the false statements. They're not uh, briefly and talk they about that, but facts. also to raise this issue with the court. Now, we argued that in our pleadings, but defendants still filed additional motions on these very issues and did a lot of his arguments. We know that the court granted the stay for defendants still because he's of the state legislature. And thus, you know, had that not happened, Mr. Beaver would be here with me talking about these issues. I think that the still pleading addressed a lot of the issues that were raised in the response by the state. And so with the, you know, forgiveness, hopefully, of my dear friend, Mr. Beaver, I'm going to mention some of the things that they mentioned. But I would hope on behalf of defendants still, the court may listen to what I say, but also prior to ruling on these particular issues might afford defendants still the opportunity to have his own oral argument day so that he could more uh, fully address these issues. And I would appreciate that on his behalf. Right. We're talking about impersonating a public officer charge, and we talk about that. When we talked about that, we talked about whether or not this the is charge David Schaefer's officer, lawyer right? uh, impersonating a public officer charge count A. We say that's subject to dismissal. You know, in that pertinent part, it says on October the 14th, on or about December 2022, unlawfully falsely held themselves out as the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia public officers with the intent to lead. Now, what we did in our pleading is we said, well, that has is defective because under the statute 2151, public officer, there is no reference there to presidential electors as being public officers, and therefore that should carry the day for it. The state's response says, well, it's not, not so fast, enough. Mr. Gillen. We've got cases here that talk about situations in which 2151 doesn't carry the day and isn't... Well, not even cases. I mean, the statute itself. Right. I mean, you're pulling that from the ethics statute. Exactly. So I'm not really sure why I would even look at that. I mean, so, public so, officers all throughout the code, and it's just kind of one of those hanging kind of question marks, I suppose. So what the state does, and I can see the court's point, I'm not going to argue that. What I am going to say is that what they say, they cite cases where are there individuals that are impersonating agents, police officers, or agents for Metro Atlanta Human Trafficking Task Force. Okay, that falls under that category. Or a federal agent. Those are things that the state responds to. I think that, that in the still motion, it covers some of the concerns the court may have regarding this issue of public officer and why we think that we should prevail on this as well. Again, hoping Mr. Beaver has his day. Well, do me the favor, actually. I've kind of put the still motions in a box and I haven't opened it yet, so make those arguments <laughs> for me. Well, I'm going to, but not as articulately, I'm sure, as Tom would, could do it, but I'll give you the flavor. The flavor of it is that in the still motion, which we adopted after it was filed, it talks about how other case law in Georgia, when it talks about, first of all, 1610-23 doesn't define public officer. So we start from that pro. So we've got that out there. So doesn't you not define the public officer. You don't officer. know what it's charging. Now, but the still pleading does say that the issue of what who is and is not a public officer is addressed in other contexts in Georgia law. 
usually in the uh, quo merito proceedings where somebody is trying to find out the legitimacy of somebody having or holding a particular office. In that context, there are cases citing in the still pleading that address this very matter. They cite Brown v. Scott and as a case in which the Brown v. Scott case, you know, whether or not an individual has designation or title given to him by law for exercises functions concerning the public assigned to him by the law, they cite Brown. The inquiry doesn't really end there. The George Supreme Court has noted the term public officer involves the idea of tenure, duration, fees, emoluments, and powers, as well as that of duty. And so that's McDuffie v. Perkinson, and that has to do really with grand jurors. So when someone says, well, is a grand juror a public officer? And the court, you know, breaks down an analysis talking about that saying, not really, because grand jurors may only meet for a few days. They're not there for some sort of duration or tenure. They don't take the same oath of office as prescribed for public officer, and they lack the element of tenure and duration, which must exist to qualify as a public officer. Okay. Well, so how would that apply again to like a purely fictional task force? Well, I mean, let's forget the purely fictional task force. Let's have it that case law from our Supreme Court, how it applies to our case and how it applies to our cases. The presidential electors are not people who have lengthy tenure and duration, which it must exist. Frankly, their job is to meet for one day. I so see your, your framework there, but if charged. the framework is actually in this, whereas the Metro Atlanta human, human trafficking, of course, that doesn't even exist. Well, it doesn't. We but someone is pretending to be tenure. an agent. Maybe and, they're a part-time. I mean, it seems like if you, I, well, you, you see, know what I mean? We might agree yeah. to disagree here because I think that when someone says, well, I'm here's my badge. I'm an, an agent of enforcement of the law for, and then names a particular entity that doesn't even exist. They're pretending to be a peace officer. They're pretending to be an agent for the government, which by the very nature of that job would have tenure, would have responsibilities, yeah. would fall into the definition that the Supreme what Court has given. What is an officer? Uh, in Brown Danny v. Scott says and McDuffie v. Pearson an as to what a public officer should be. An officer and so, under Georgia law uh, says in that this, context, our client did not uh, do we that. Have, so this and, cannot uh, we be a have, crime. Uh, and same thing, actually, it popped up again on the issue in Morris v. Peters, another case, Supreme Court case, dealing with whether or not someone mm. is a public officer. That had to do with, quo warranto against the chairman of the Georgia Democratic Party <laughs> and whether or not he would fall in as a public officer. Bottom lining it, like in that case, and which found that he was not, like the like grand jurors and public official, party officials, presidential electors are not public officials under Georgia law, especially for purposes of 1610-23. Their jobs, services are temporary, like the grand juries. They, their position really only arises once every four years. is limited to a single meeting on a single day. So it lacks that element of tenure and duration, which must exist. So, you know, it's kind of like back to the political case, Morris v. Peters case, which dealt with a state party political chairman, nominated in accordance with the rules of their party, because the fact that they were nominated by the rules of their party doesn't make them a public official. So, and like grand jurors, presidential electors, they're not receiving their salaries for their service. So, so all of that, just found Honor, some statute. Us, eh, they kind of uh, impersonated that, somebody. That the, but presidential you know, electors are not officials under Georgia law. Uh, count the statutes for. is flawed for the very purpose of these electors cannot be under Georgia law public officers. And so, you know, although we agree with the court's initial position regarding the limitation on the definition of public officer in our pleading, good old Tom Beaver and the still pleading has come forward to rescue us on that point. If you look at what they did, and hopefully Tom will do a better job of articulating those points, in their pleading, they talk about specifically some other cases that get into either in Texas and I think Utah as well that deal more specifically with this. But for the purposes of argument today, I think that we've sort of got the drift on what I think is happening on the impersonation of public officers. They're not public officers. And clearly, under the direction we believe of our Supreme Court, they could not be so judged. Now, again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time up here with the court, but I do want to touch on a few of the other components of our pleading. The forgery counts. Now, the you know we indicated in those counts 10 and 16 are sufficient to dismissal. You know, writing a check in a fictitious name or a manner that the writing is made or altered proportionally have been made by another person. That's the definition of 1610. What we have here in this indictment is we have an assertion that a writing or other than a check in a manner that the writing is made purports to be made by authority of the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia who did not give such authority. Now, that's what 
they allege. Let's break that down as to why and the state's response to us saying they want to focus on the phrase under the authority. And what we have here is the concept of what is the authority? Who is this on October the 14th? Who was the duly elected and qualified presidential elector from the state of Georgia who did not give such authority on December the 14th, 2020? Now, the answer to that is that as a matter of law, simply as a matter of law, and we're now we're going back, Your Honor, to some of the arguments we've made with the court earlier on the issue of supremacy clause, but worthy of at least highlighting some of those points to the court for the purpose of making our point here. And that is this, that, you know, be under the federal law as it existed in 2020, when the state of Georgia failed to comply with federal law about having an adjudication of any pending controversy or litigation. And as we know, in the public record in this courthouse was the pending and unresolved Trump and Schaefer litigation on the election. Now, because that lawsuit was not adjudicated pursuant to federal law, then the state of Georgia lost its ability on after Safe Harbor Day, lost its ability to then name who the electors should be. And as we discussed earlier, and I'll shorten the argument, but for the sake of purpose of the record, I'll just make the following points. Once that happens, and it's very, very clear from federal law and from the language from Bush v. Gore, the state, any sending opinion in Bush v. Gore. Yeah, true. But as it points there, it's like they see it as not even a serious issue because the clear reading of the statute would say, if you don't get it done by Safe Harbor Day, then you have lost out. And once that happens, the power then shifts back to the Congress. So as of, by law, we think not a factual issue, by law on December the 14th, 2020, there were no duly elected and qualified presidential electors from the state of Georgia because of that failure. Now, the other matter I'd like to discuss is the false statement component on the false statement counts. Now, the issue here dealing with the false statement, for example, is when they're asserting that there was a, a document within the jurisdiction of the Office of the Georgia Secretary of State and the Office of the Governor of Georgia Departments and Agencies of the Government. Now, we've got two arguments to that. Number one... This is that they uh, falsely held themselves and again, out as alternate back to electors. Haley. Haley talks about this issue. And when Haley talks about it, the key thing is there was agency with the key phrase, with authority to act on it. Now, there are two flaws, the fatal flaws the state has as it relates to this issue the concerning is Haley the state and on the issue concerning the safe harbor. One, as we mentioned, at that time, there was nothing for the state of Georgia to act upon. They merely received the information. It was merely uh, sort of a um, Placeholder. ministerial act, if you would. But even more fatal to their argument is the second argument that I made a moment ago, which I won't repeat other than referencing it. The failure to act by safe harbor date renders any activity on behalf of the state of Georgia, be it the governor or the secretary of state, renders that gone because now Wait. it's all gone back up to Washington, to Congress to deal with that. And the state can't now say or at any time say, well, we're saying that Democratic nominees or the Democratic representatives for the electors, they ultimately became the duly elected. You don't do that. You don't retro parachute back into what happened on December the 14th. The world as we know it on December the 14th, there were neither Democrat or Republicans that were duly elected under federal law. And so given that, we believe that the false statement counts should go. Thank you, Ron. So when they signed the All document right. on the 14th, they weren't impersonating okay, anything. Any there from, there uh, wasn't anything to be impersonating. Mr. Wooten, this one's yours. I don't agree that it's a matter of law. It is an issue of fact. And we've briefed this extensively and argued this before. We believe that even if it's not an issue of fact, even if the court were to consider it as a matter of law, we've given ample reasons why under statute, all of these entities have jurisdiction over many of the crimes that are alleged in the indictment. Many of the topics that, well, all of the topics where we've alleged that some of these defendants have made false statements regarding. So I do maintain that I believe that it's an issue of fact for the jury to decide that we have to put up that evidence. Evidence. We have to ask the GBI officers, you know, what is your duty? What is your authority? What can you investigate? We have to ask the Secretary of State off individuals while they're on the stand. What are your duties? What is your job? What do you do? Why are these things relevant? Why are these material to areas where you have jurisdiction to do something? What is your ability to act on these things? I think all of that has to come out at trial. And so as it relates to that argument, I think it's way premature. And anything that, again, I always go back to the standard for what is a demur, right? Right. But what I'm saying, there was a statute that explicitly said that they didn't have jurisdiction. Remind me, what is it that you're saying just as a matter of 
of law is apparent that provides the governor authority over this after the safe harbor day. Judge, I don't have the indictment in front of me, so I'd need to know specifically what statement we're talking. I think, I, mean, I think, I think this it. is in regard to the certificates or the paperwork where, you know, if an elector doesn't show up on election day or on December 14th, that the governor has to ratify a replacement of that person. I think there were some documents that were delivered by Mr. Schaefer and his co-conspirators to the governor's office okay. trying to get the governor to do that. That's provided by statute that the governor is the one that has to ratify a replacement. So statutorily, he absolutely has the authority to act on that matter. Talking about okay. the inner All right, but from the, the top, uh, I think there was a lot election. of time spent on definition of public officer and some of the allegations raised in Mr. Still's briefing, which I think his motion deadline should be coming up soon. So we'll help if he's requesting argument, we'd have him in. Sure. But if you want to make any initial we, reactions, have at Well it. prepared, Judge. All right. I've made this statement uh, in the past as it relates to Mr. Schaefer, and I'll make it again, which is we have to address an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is that Mr. Schaefer is in the 11th Circuit right you now. slept with Fanny? Demanding to be recognized as a federal officer. So, I mean, are we saying that this position of elector is an officer or isn't? I think they need to make up their mind there. I've actually got quite a bit of ground to cover and I'll kind of take as it was raised by Mr. Gillen. And again, as we pointed out in our response, we don't believe that the definition section I think applies. it is much conceded that, so. But judge, if it did apply, I think it actually supports us. Because if you look at paragraph B, this is 2153.22B, it says public officer means every other elected state official not listed in subparagraph A. So it's a comp comprehensive definition of any elected state official. So we believe would absolutely cover it to the extent that it's persuasive that it shows that, that presidential electors are public officers. That definition says any elected state official. So they are elected state officials. I want to hit briefly on the cases that were raised by Mr. Gillen as it relates to what Mr. Still put in his pleadings prepared to address those. First, there was an intimation that 161023 only applies to police officers or peace officers. We know that that's not true because of a case called Kennedy versus Carlton. That's 294 Georgia 576, 2014 Georgia Supreme Court case where a conviction was upheld for someone impersonating an, a DFAX employee, clearly not a police officer, a peace officer of any kind. So we can dispense with that argument. As it relates to the cases that, that Mr. Gillen referenced, the definition of public officer in other contexts, all of those cases deal with the definition of public officer in the context, a petition for quo warranto. I believe there's three cases that are referenced in Mr. Still's plea we're filing our response to that tomorrow, but I can kind of take them in turn. Mr. Gillen referenced this list of qualifications in the McDuffie case, tenure, emoluments, in duties, etc. An That's not the holding of McDuffie. So the way that the McDuffie case is structured, the Georgia Supreme Court says no one's ever definitively said what a public officer is in the context of Quo Rento. Well, look, if you're about to file a response and Mr. Beaver may be requesting oral argument, why don't we just save it for when I've had sure, a chance to sure. read I, these cases and then we can be more productive. Sure, I can point. skip those cases, yeah. but I do want to hit a few points, Judge, as it relates to the statutes that establish that presidential electors are public officers. First of all, the actual office itself is created by law. So it's created by the United States Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, and it's also created by OCGA 21-2-10. So they're defending that their actually indictment, establishes they're defending that there their is charges. An, we charge an them office appropriately. of a presidential elector in Remember, this state. Six charges um, they have duties that are established by law. Those are established both in the U.S. Constitution and the 12th Amendment, as well as at OCGA 21-2-11. By law, they're elected by the public, 21-2-10. And also there was a reference that they don't get a salary. That's actually not true. There's a compensation for presidential electors that is set forth by law, the OCGA 21-2-13. Additionally, the election code itself refers to the office of presidential elector. It refers to it as an office. In two places in particular, 21-2-132A and 21-2-132 2-132E. And again, rely on those cases that Mr. Gillen discussed. Garrison versus the state, 276 Georgia App, 243, 2005 case where someone was convicted for impersonating a federal agent, an unspecified federal agent, and that conviction was upheld by the Georgia Court of Appeals. Cert was denied by the Georgia Supreme Court. And then the Liberty case where they, of course, so other impersonated the other Metro Atlanta that have counted as officers that doesn't the charges exist. So stuck. we would argue to the court that the definition for 161023 these purposes that our appellate courts have applied a very liberal definition as a public officer. It doesn't even have to be a real public officer. It doesn't have to be whatever, a state just officer. Everyone. Anything that purports to be, you know, someone acting by authority of the government yeah. is a public officer. And that's certainly what presidential electors do. Their positions created by law, their duties are established by law. So again, the statute right, is so jumping valid down to as the charged the because they're alleging he's a presidential.
presidential officer Again, and elephant in the room. elector is an officer. Uh, 1691, there's and so the law at least five that ways person. that you can violate the forgery statute. The case that Mr. Schaefer relies on, Jackson versus the state, that's someone who is charged with forgery based on purporting a document so purporting to have been the made by another person. Document. We did not charge under that provision of 1691. We charged under the final provision, which is by authority of one who did not give such authority. Mr. Gillen says that we didn't object to looking at these you know, things in, in the record in other cases. Let me be clear for the record, we do object. That's the definition of going outside of the indictment. So we agree with the court that considering those things outside of the indictment absolutely transforms that into a speaking demur. It's void. It can't be granted. If you look at the counts, the forgery counts, they track exactly the forgery statute. Case law tells us that that's what's sufficient for a general demur. I don't know that there's anything else to say about those counts. As it relates to the false statements, again, address that at the very beginning. But I would point out that in Haley, where both the conviction was upheld and the indictment itself was approved of, the indictment said this on the false statements counts. It said that the defendant did knowingly and willfully make a false and fictitious statement and representation in a matter within the jurisdiction of the GBI, a governmental agency, by calling himself the catch me killer and stating that he killed 16 people. It doesn't allege any of the things that Mr. Schaefer says in his pleadings that have to be alleged. They don't have to be alleged. Like they've done in other motions, the defendant here is trying to add elements to this offense that just don't exist, trying to add pleading requirements that don't exist. And Haley tells us the case itself directly quotes the indictment. That indictment alleges far less than what we allege in our indictment. And they said that the Georgia Supreme Court said that that case is just fine. With that, I'll take any questions that the court might have. Thank you, Mr. Wooten. Okay, so Mr. Gillen, your last motion we had for today. The last motion has some overlap with the current the state issues. did not and cannot answer the direct question about a violation of the safe harbor rule, why that would allow that situation to give the governor or the secretary of state any authority to do anything. That is, it comes in under several of the arguments that we've made. I won't repeat it, but they simply, their argument is, let's put an agent up and ask the agent whether or not he had authority. No, by law, by federal law, they did not have the authority. It's not whether some GBI agent thinks that he can come in here and tell the jury, pay no attention to federal law, pay no attention to the dissenting opinion in Bush v. Gore, pay no attention to that. I'm a GBI agent. I say we can do it. That's wrong. They lose there because the law is very, very, very clear. And we can go back and we'll both the state and I know the Schaefer team will go back to look at our argument that we made to the court when my recollection could be wrong. I don't think so. We'll see. But my recollection was because the pleading was a part of the court system that we had a, a citation which permitted the court to take that into consideration as part of the record and thus not going outside of the record for speaking to Murr. I could be wrong, but we'll get that to you quickly because that latch on to that to say, pay no attention to the reality of what happened in this courthouse in the court filings, which destroys their argument. Kind of as we were with the First Amendment issue, I think we need to figure out where we are procedurally. Let's start with just the authority to kind of take a scalpel to an indictment and cut out things we don't like. Well, I mean, Your Honor, we talk about, there are two components to this motion. One, there's the strike surplusage, and then there's a dismissal that we asked for, which is kind of also a component of the other. You know, we cite the state fee Corin on the issue of being able to, you know, the allegation the indictment is not wholly unnecessary to constitute an offense as mere surplusage. But when we read the surplusage opinions, we're talking about, you know, a miscited code section or a wrong date or something like that. So I don't know, I don't think that's what you're characterizing. No, no, I guess this is where I'm It's more just a legal conclusion, right? A legal conclusion, number one, but it's even more than that. It's this. When they continually, in their pleadings, in the indictment, in their pleadings, in their extrajudicial comments that they make, they have bombarded the defendants, the electors in this case, with the concept of, in the phrase of, fake electors. Now, that is a description, a conclusion, and a pejorative description. Sure. So it's a legal conclusion you very much disagree with it's the core of your defense. I think it's not only a legal conclusion, but it's also something that we should be stricken because it is a just a pejorative statement. I'm not saying, I'm saying, you know, I can call you something really nasty in an indictment, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a legal conclusion about your violation of, of a particular law. So that's what we have here. And we have this permeating this case. Well, I'm just trying to, again, based on what we've seen and is allowable in Georgia, let's just make it simpler. If in a murder indictment, someone's alleged to have acted with malice of forethought, that's a legal conclusion. Well, that's right. And it's someone the defendant may really have an issue with, but we don't strike it. We just go forward and we go well, to trial. that's part of different the law. world, different cases, not the point that I'm trying to make. Well, and that's a part of the what law. What I'm trying to make is... Malice uh, of forethought's you know, part of the law. You put in malice of forethought because you put that in 
there to it's define the element, terms. Sure. Yeah, it's an well, element. What about this one? There's one I remember. Thank you. When we talk about nicknames and aliases, and I remember there's one in Georgia from the 90s. They put in an alias of Stomper, Stomper. and he beat the defendant <laughs> to death. Well, and the Supreme Court said that's okay. You know why? Because they probably proved that there was an alias of that guy called Stomper. That's different than the that's at trial. The, State's saying we're going to prove that you're well, I, I, an unlawful I think, elector. Well, they, 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 they in this indictment, what they have done in the indictment, it's not necessary for, and we think it should be stricken. We think the count should be dismissed. We know that based upon the case law that we've cited. But in closing arguments, Lord forbid we ever get to closing arguments, hope we don't. But if we did, and they stood up and they said, well, we think that they were fake, that we think the evidence shows that they were fake electors. That's one thing. That's argument. That's advocacy. There's no place for it in the indictment. And there's no place for it in what they have done, not only in the indictment, but in their pleadings and statements they've made outside to the media. What they have tried to do is they want to have ingrained in the minds of the community and of jurors a concept that if you are not a Democratic elector on December the 14th, By casting you're some other part of the state capital, then you are a fake elector. And that is a pejorative term, not necessary for the charges and should be stricken. That's the point that we're trying to make. And as it relates to our other arguments concerning the dismissal of those counts, I don't think I need to go back over most of my argument or our argument on that really deals with the Electoral Count Act. So I don't think I need to revisit that in case the court really, really wants to hear that again. I don't think you do. There was a lot of overlap between the two motions. We think, number one, that the count should be dismissed. The reasons articulated earlier and in our pleading. And number two, that even if the counts are dismissed, in addition to that, references throughout the indictment to fake electors should be stricken as well. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Yellen. All right. So that was the first hearing back since Fannie was saved by Judge Scott McAfee. She didn't show up in court. This is some of what we were talking about here. So this is what the filing looked like from Steve Sadow. Steve Sadow sent this one in and you can see state of Georgia versus Trump. Just briefly to give us some background or to fill in some of the gaps, they say, you know, as stated at the hearing previously, this is what came in before the hearing today. They say the First Amendment, this was Steve Sadow's argument, says that only though it protects Trump, right? And basically all of these counts against Trump Trump can't be charged because the overt acts, every single alleged overt act. So right, remember the indictment in the RICO case is a big series of overt acts, essentially. See all these different overt acts. These are not separate charges, not separate crimes, but they're saying there's a bunch of different stuff that happened and each one of those can be added up into an overt act. And so basically what they're saying here in Trump's motion, which is to dismiss the indictment, essentially, it's a demur, saying that they're trying to criminalize those overt acts acts, but those overt acts are content-based core political speech and their expressive conduct, which is all protected by the First Amendment, saying the offenses that are alleged against Trump involve five distinct areas. The elector certificates that were sent to Congress, the request that was made of the Georgia Speaker to call a special session, the verification attached to the lawsuit that was challenging the presidential election, the call to Raffensperger, and the letter to Raffensperger, right? Those are the different, ultimately, charges. Now, the RICO account says there's a broad conspiracy about all of those different conversations, saying it's unlawful. But Sadow said, wrong! Like every American, Trump has the First Amendment. It protects Trump's speech, just like it does for the rest of us. If there is any constant in our democratic system of government, or what's left of it, it is that the marketplace of ideas, not the mandates of government functionaries or partisan prosecutors, determines how we debate in America. The founders sought to protect the right to engage in political speech, which includes free discussion of government affairs, including rigged elections. And the speech clause embodies our national commitment to the free exchange of ideas, which used to be, okay? We do not have a free speech country anymore. That's not a value that is something that a lot of people care about. Amendment offers its broadest protection and free speech regarding government affairs, but it encourages exactly the kind of behavior that's under attack here. We want people to ferret out corruption and problems in our government. Free marketplace of ideas is at the function, is at the centerpiece of our our country, but this indictment by Fannie literally directly targets core protected speech and activity. And so it's categorically invalid under the First Amendment. They say no exception to the First Amendment applies here. This is Steve Sadow saying the speech integral to criminal conduct exception doesn't apply here, right? Because all of the charged conduct is protected. To fall within the exception about criminal speech, right? Criminal speech is not protected if it's integral to the conduct. Then the speech, it must be integral to some criminal conduct. But the conduct that is alleged here that's a crime
time is protected speech in and of itself. So it must be integral, protected speech that is integral to other protected speech and other protected activities remains protected. And they give us some cases that Steve Sadow walked us through. But in Fulton, the Fannie prosecutors have not identified any non-speech or non-advocacy conduct in the allegations against Trump. Examination of the indictment reveals why. Just look at it. None of the allegations relate to any non-speech or non-advocacy conduct. Every charge, every single overt act that's alleged against Trump rests on core acts of political speech and advocacy that the First Amendment protects. And likewise, all the factual allegations in the indictment pivot on the indictment's core faulty theory that Trump supposedly engaged in fraud, false obstruction by repeatedly saying the election was rigged. And Fulton County prosecutors are wrong. They're concluding that claims of fraud are not protected speech. Sure as heck is. Trump's claims of fraud constitute free speech. The Supreme Court has talked a lot about this. Alvarez produced multiple opinions, but nine justices were unanimous. Under the First Amendment, the government may not prohibit or criminalize speech on disputed social, political, or historical issues simply because the government says some is true and some is false. Justice Kennedy held that counter speech was sufficient because only a weak, pathetic society and weak, pathetic people who make up that society needs government protection or intervention before it pursues its resolve to preserve truth. Only a weak, pathetic society run by weak and pathetic people need government protection. Nothing is truer than that. Truth needs neither handcuffs nor a badge for its vindication. The fact that the prosecution alleges that the speech was false does not change the conclusion. Alito said the same thing in the dissent. The opinion least protective of speech affirmed even this principle, said it's of a grave and unacceptable danger to suppress truthful speech and even non-truthful speech because who could be the arbiter of what's true or not? Who knows? Any attempt by the Fulton prosecutors to distinguish this must fail. The indictment does not and the prosecution cannot identify any non-speech or non-advocacy conduct by Trump. This convincingly demonstrates that the prosecution of Trump is political and it's for political speech and the conduct that the prosecution alleges is false and they can't just do that. The Supreme Court case supports our argument. Any argument that falsity is not a viewpoint doesn't make any sense. The prosecutor's position here disputes the outcome of 2020 and a law that criminalizes people who have a different opinion is blatantly unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination. Criminalizing Trump's speech and advocacy, disputing the outcome while speech endorsing the election's outcome is viewed as unimpeachable. It's blatant viewpoint discrimination. Trump says it was rigged. You say it wasn't. You charge him with a crime for that. That's your opinion that's different than his. Now, the expansive interpretation of criminal law, as the First Amendment applies to it, shows that the court cannot rely on the government's discretion to protect these types of prosecutions. And so thus, a statute in this field can be linguistically interpreted. If it could be interpreted to be a meat axe or a scalpel, use it as the latter. And so in conclusion, Steve Sadow says, the core political speech and expressive conduct alleged in this indictment against Trump are protected from government regulation and thus criminal prosecution. And that fact becomes even more clear when considering the context here. Trump was challenging a rigged election, political speech that was directed at state legislatures, state officials, all tasked with investigating the election, and other lawsuits against officials who were doing the same. The speech sought action by the government, which is the very body responsible for doing the governing. It was directed at bodies responsible for conducting government business, the bodies with the information in their possession, the bodies undertaking the investigation. The speech was directed at the government that the founders believed should always be challenged. And the bodies that must be capable of being challenged in a democracy where citizens are capable of guarding against oppression. Now, as applied here, the prosecution seeks to use statutes to charge Trump that were never intended to criminalize speech. Look at these cases. The statute was not sufficiently tailored and it was meant to annoy him. And so the court held that it was invalid. Same principle remains here. The speech and the expressive conduct took place in the coveted halls that the founders created for citizens to resolve these the complaints. Trump was talking to the courts, to the legislatures, to the state officials. And so regulating his speech usurps the First Amendment, saying the First Amendment prohibits the state from weaponizing its powers to silence disfavored viewpoints like the election was rigged and to prevent people from advocating those viewpoints. This is the ordinary course in a free society. And so this court should hold that the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech when applied to the core political speech and the expressive conduct in this indictment demands a pretrial trial remedy. And you know what that remedy is, says Steve Sadow? Dismiss this indictment.
from Steve Sadel and Jennifer Little, which may have been seated next to him. It has a rhyme. It sort of rhymes with the presidential immunity claim, right? It's almost immunity via the First Amendment. Trump has the immunity to execute the laws. If the election is rigged, he's got the authority, in fact, the moral obligation, the sworn duty to go in and to investigate it. And that's all he's done. And they're prosecuting him for that because they don't want him to win. So that was from Steve Sadow. Now, David Schaefer also sent in a couple of motions, quick highlights on these, but two of them with a lot of overlap between the two. He said, David Schaefer files this special demur and a motion to strike these legal conclusions. Schaefer disputes the allegations and says this stuff should be stricken. So Schaefer writes, the state has brought criminal charges against Schaefer and others for meeting and voting as electors and sending a certificate in. And they repeatedly refer to, quote, Trump presidential elector nominees, makes allegations about a scheme and so on. But the indictment also repeatedly and improperly charges that the Democratic Party of Georgia's electors were valid, right? They say the Democrats were valid and they say that the Republicans were false. They say that's ridiculous. At the time of the conduct charged in the indictment, Georgia law says that candidates may qualify if they follow the rules. The Constitution says that electors can meet and they transmit the list to Congress. Now, during the time of this conduct, the Electoral Count Act stated if a state has provided for a final determination, then it shall be conclusive. Bush versus Gore was also brought up, which we heard during oral arguments. Now, the indictment says that Georgia's people, the Democrats, were duly elected and everyone else was invalid. But this is unproven, saying that's a legal conclusion. Mr. Schaefer was nominated by the Republican Party and as an elector entirely consistent with state law. So there was no crime there, right? It's insufficient. The Electoral Count Act further doesn't prohibit Schaefer and the Republicans from meeting and casting their votes. The state possesses no legal ground whatsoever to charge in its indictment that the Democrats were duly qualified. They don't make that basis. Vice President does. The prosecution's references, as alleged, should be stricken. They were not duly qualified. The indictment also says that David Schaefer was a false Electoral College person. These conclusions are erroneous and need to be stricken. The inclusion of this is going to confuse the jurors. It's a conclusory statement. Mr. Schaefer and the other Republican electors were legitimate electors whose votes would be accepted by Congress, could be accepted as lawful electoral votes. And so they are erroneously saying differently. And also, they're not even public officers. So if you're saying that we're trying to impersonate a public officer, your public officer doesn't apply to the facts of our case. So it's insufficient. The prosecution cannot be proved by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that there were any writings that were altering the Democratic alternate electors, okay? They wrote Republican elector, not votes, but the Democrat electors, they wrote theirs. And we didn't manipulate theirs, okay? So we didn't fraudulently modify their documents. And so Mr. Schaefer is entitled to a proper indictment. He's entitled to an indictment without improper and prejudicial conclusory allegations. And the striking from the indictment, the identity, is also deficient. And so based upon the facts, we move to strike all of this from the indictment and dismiss these counts as to defendant David Schaefer, counts 8, 9, 8, 10, and 16. Signed by Craig Gillen and Holly Pearson. Shout out to them. Schaefer's other filing, again, general and special demurs, saying, moreover, they allege that Schaefer made phone calls or sent emails or texts. None of that conduct is the basis for any substantive charge. They say that on December 14th, Schaefer encouraged persons to sign a document entitled Certificate of the Votes of Electors from Georgia. The state seeks to punish this conduct, but that conduct was lawful at the time. In nearly all of the charged conduct, Schaefer was only attempting to comply with the advice of counsel and the requirements under the law. In fact, he was following the precedent of 1960 Hawaii, which is what we talked about. Remember, the United States Supreme Court observed this in 1960. They said in Hawaii, Hawaii appointed two slates of electors and Congress chose which one to appoint. Alternate slates of electors, two slates, and the Democrats did it. Republican electors were certified by the acting governor. A recount was ordered on December 13th. Both Democrat and Republican electors met on the appointed day. On January 4th, the newly elected governor certified the Democrat electors. Huh, it's like a placeholder, which we've talked about many times. The certification was received by Congress and they were then counted. So Republicans thought they had the win in the bag. They didn't. The Democrats lodged their alternate electors. We came back and sat them. The Supreme Court also held that peaceable assembly for lawful discussion cannot be made a crime and to those who assist in the conduct of such meetings cannot be branded as criminals. And so David Schaefer's challenges to the charges against him are on the grounds that a 
a lack of notice that his conduct violates the statutes. And so he thinks this indictment should be quashed. Now, if the indictment is considered on its face, the indictment is problematic because it's missing important elements. Now, based on the fatal defects in the indictment, the charges are subject to dismissal and to demur. Schaefer is entitled to an indictment in perfect form. He needs to know what it says. And here, we don't. The indictment is insufficient. We must know what it actually charges. The purpose of the indictment is to allow the defense to, you know, prepare a defense. But this indictment is messed up. Count one charges that he was associated with an enterprise and blah, blah, blah. Now, it alleges that they were involved in a conspiracy and it provides that it's unlawful for a person to be involved in the conspiracy. Now, this requirement is codified in the law, but if you view any of the allegations in count one in a manner most favorable to the state, this is defective as it relates to Schaefer because there is no pattern of alleged racketeering activity. Here are the acts. They say this is all Schaefer did, Fanny. He didn't do anything illegal. Okay, here's one act. He received or sent emails to co-conspirators. He got a telephone call. He sent text messages. He got a room at the Georgia State Capitol. He encouraged individuals to sign the certificate. He signed the certificate himself. He instructed another person to deliver the document and then Schaefer allegedly made certain statements. Now, neither these texts or emails nor the reservation of the room, none of that constitutes racketeering activity. None of the conduct constitutes any offense under Georgia law. The prosecution is furthermore not even charged any of these emails or texts that were received by Schaefer as alleged offenses. So setting aside all of this, during his voluntary interviews with Fulton County, all all the alleged criminal conduct that was attributed to Schaefer would have occurred on a single date back on December 14th. And so this indictment and fails to allege the elements, right? There is no pattern. There is no continuity. Just one day. Failure by them to show a pattern means they fail an essential element. This all happened on essentially one day. And so count eight should fail because he was not impersonating a public officer. What is a public officer? You know, governor, lieutenant, it's codified here under Georgia law. Very specific. Every elected municipal official and so on. An elector doesn't meet that standard. They're not public officers. Impersonating an officer is fatally defective because it isn't a public officer. It's for somebody who impersonates one of these people. Each member of the General Assembly, every elected county official, board of local education, elected municipal people, head of departments or agencies. It doesn't say presidential electors in here. Governor, lieutenant governor, so on. So it should go. Now as to forgery charges, the forgery laws in Georgia say what they are accordingly. But here, there's no allegations that Schaefer forged anything. The prosecution has furthermore knowingly omitted from its indictment the fact that Schaefer used his actual name, okay? It wasn't fraudulent or it was his name and he was doing it under authority from the state that says he can. So continuing, they say that count needs to go away and criminal attempt to submit a false document charge is also ridiculous. Saying the law says it is defined here but count 14 suffers from a fatal defect. It alleges that Schaefer attempted to send a certificate but the count fails to specify to which person allegedly sent the certificate. So who sent it? You said it is an attempt to transmit a document, send a certificate, somebody sent it, but we don't know who sent it. And so because it's missing details about the essential element of the crime, we can't properly defend ourselves. This is a violation of our due process and this case needs to be dismissed. And so based on this, dismiss the indictment and dismiss these counts against David Schaefer, signed by Craig Gillen, brought into Judge McAfee's so-called courtroom. And so big, big motions that have been dropped. And we'll see what Scott McAfee does there, whether he'll dismiss any more charges. Remember that some charges have already been dismissed in another special demur because of some specificity problems. And so we're going to be here covering to see what continues on in this case, my friends, because we're going to wait for Judge McAfee to come out and issue a ruling. Are more charges going to be dismissed or is Judge McAfee going to continue to support Fannie Willis and her her government prosecutors in everything that they do and allow them to continue on with this clearly unconstitutional indictment that violates people's rights to have due process, to have notice under the law, and to be able to exercise their free speech under the law. We're going to be here continuing to cover this case, my friends. So wherever it is you're watching us, my friends, thank you for liking this video. Thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thanks for inviting a friend or family member to come over here and join us because we live stream five days a week, six days a week for our members, and we'd love to have you and your friends here joining us as we cover all of this. We got some great links down in the description below. Watchingthewatchers.locals.com is where we do member-only streams in the morning and streams on Saturday. We have an amazing community there as well. Also want to invite you to check out robertgovea.com if you want to grab any PDFs that we cover here. You can download those online.
online at robertgovea.com. And you can grab brand new shirt or some gear by shopping on our YouTube channel. Now we have the shopping tab. And so if you like polo shirts, I link some of the polos that I wear on our shopping tab. You can go to Nordstrom's, click my link, go over to Nordstrom's. They've got some great deals. Load up your cart. They've got a lot more than just polos, tons of other stuff over there as well. And you can support the channel by grabbing some new gear and looking amazing while you do it. So we'll see you back here on the next one.